Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Buddhang dhammang sangang namasami. Well, truly a joy to be here with, with uh, the Clear Mountain community. Uh, feel so much uh, joy and inspiration from, from the vibrancy, earnestness, diversity of, of the community. And personally, as a bhikkhuni, just so uh, cared for and, and welcome and supported by Ajahn Kobolo, Ajahn Nisabo, and rejoice in the that equal, warm, caring holding that happens for uh, my dear sisters in the Pacific Northwest, for Ayananda Bodhi and Seminary Junha, and now uh, Aya Subhijana and Aya Nyanaka. Yeah, so I'm very, very thankful to, to be here this morning. If you've been around the Dhamma for any length of time, you most likely will have heard this often quoted saying that the that the Buddha gives, where he says that I teach one thing and one thing only, and that is suffering and the end of suffering. <clears throat> Which really is almost a shorthand for the Four Noble Truths, the seminal teachings of, of the Buddha. In the final book, of the connected discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya. There's a short sutta. It, it's called the, the Mahavaga, the great book. And there's a short sutta in chapter 45, late in the chapter, Sutta 165. Very short. The Buddha says, there are three kinds of suffering. In Pali, dukkha dukkata is the first and these three kinds of suffering, the Buddha is basically going from very gross to, to, to very, very, very subtle, from the obvious to the not obvious, actually. So this first level is dukkha dukkata. And in English, this is just pain, mental pain, physical pain, dukkha dukkata. And each life has a certain dose of this. This is this is real, gross, obvious suffering. Uh, th this is this is <clears throat> sorry, I got a chat. This is uh, you know your country breaks out in war. This this is you experience rape or 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 deep betrayal, uh, abuse. Uh, you have uh, you live with chronic pain. You know you have you, you you or your loved ones receive devastating diagnoses. This is dukkha dukkata. Each life has a certain dosage of it. Universal. The second level is sankara dukkata, and this is really this is the five hindrances. This is the suffering of the five hindrances. Our, our, our sankharas, our constructions, which are full of hindrances and, and ignorance. And again, a, a universal component to it and, and a personal component. And it's only when these five hindrances are in abeyance that, that we see the depth of the suffering in the five hindrances and, and we experience a reprieve and, and a, a relief and a release. And each one of us have had a certain taste of that, some a very, very deep taste. 
And it's then when the, but this is not, this is samadhi, but this is not awakening. And it's then when the mind is collected and the mind is still uh, that this third level of suffering that the Buddha talks about can be seen. When the mind is still and collected, the suttas describe it as malleable and, and wield, wieldy. And then you can see this third level of suffering that is very, 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 very subtle. And in Pali, this is viparinama dukkha, dukkata. And this really is the three characteristics. Viparinama is change. It's the it's the suffering of change. It's the suffering of, of when the mind is very, very still, you will start to see that, that everything is moving. Everything is in flux. Nothing, nothing, nothing is stable. Nothing is reliable. Nothing to hang on to. Nothing is substantial. This is a Nietzsche dukkha anatta, the three characteristics. Again, again, universal. And then the Buddha says, that the way to deal with this suffering, this is the suffering, and then he points to the end of suffering and, and, and points to the Eightfold Noble Path. And the point of the path is to un come to understand this suffering at all three levels. And, and with that, when you really face it and, and understand it, there, will, there just will be a disenchantment. There will be a release. There will be a stream entry, and 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 further. There will be awakening. This personal and universal aspect of of our suffering is captured beautifully in this dis this discourse, this conversation that a Brahmin has with the Buddha. Also from the collected discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya, in the first book, the book of verses. And in chapter seven of, of the first book of the Samyutta Nikaya, there's this there's 20 different accounts of these exchanges that Brahmins, they're all from the same clan, the Brada Bara. Vajja clan, the Bharadvaja clan. And they all go and have their own hearing with the Buddha. And most of them are going to, you know, they think, trip up the Buddha. And they all end up becoming followers. Many of them are hunts, many of them monastics. But this particular conversation is with Jata Bharadvaja. And he's, and Jata means matted. And he plays off his name, obviously must have had matted hair, dreadlocks, and got that name. He plays off his name in this interaction with the Buddha. And he starts thinking, I think, that he can trip up the Buddha and is absolutely blown away with the Buddha's profundity and clarity in his answer. But he starts off by saying to the Buddha, a tangle inside, a tangle outside. This generation is entangled in a tangle. I ask you, O Gotama, and this shows that he sees the Buddha as just a guy, Gotama, not the Buddha, not yet. I ask you, O Gotama, who can disentangle this tangle? And the Buddha answers, really the Eightfold Noble Path, the Buddha answers, one established on virtue, wise, developing the mind and wisdom. Those ardent and discreet, they can disentangle this tangle. And then the Buddha goes on and describes beings that have done this, arahants, that are completely free from the tangle. The Buddha's answer, one established on virtue, this is part of the Noble Eightfold Path, sila, the virtue part. Wise, developing the mind. This is our meditation. This is our, this is our development of samadhi. 
and wisdom will come out of this. This is Panya. And this is the way to the end of suffering. Sila Samadhi Panya. So Jata Bharadvaja talks about a tangle inside, a tangle outside. This generation is entangled in a tangle. Jata Bharadvaja said this 2,500 years ago. Sometimes we can get caught up thinking, you know, everything's so bad and it's, it's getting worse. I don't know. This is 2,500 years ago. And the reality is, this is samsara. The reality is every generation before Jata brought Jata Dva, Jata Bharadvaja, I'm going to stop saying his name, just call him Jata. Jata said this, every generation was entangled. And every generation since Jata said this, a tangle inside, a tangle outside, who can, uh, this generation is entangled in a tangle. When I was still a laywoman and, and, and still working, I remember going to a training, going to a workshop, and the, I think it was a psychologist was delivering the workshop and he started by reading this paragraph, this paragraph that was lamenting the lostness of the upcoming generation, waxing on about their wildness. And it could have been written by my parents' generation. Frankly, it could have been written by my generation about my then teenage children. And he ends this paragraph sort of, Asking, you know, so any ideas about who, who wrote this? And <laughs> turns out it was uh, from the Egyptian Empire. It was like four to five thousand years earlier. And honestly, this is just this is samsara. This generation is entangled in a tangle. And then there's this amazing part where it. Jata talks about a tangle inside. And this, this is the this is the linchpin of the Buddha's teachings. That we all the, the tangle is universal, the tangle is a hundred percent across the board, everybody, and yet there's this personal aspect to the tangle. We all have a tangle, and we all have our own unique, personal tangle, a tangle inside. So the fact of the tangle is completely universal. Pain, dukkha, dukkha dukkata, and then the hindrances, sankara dukkata, and then the three characteristics, viparinama dukkata. We all... We all are entangled, every generation. And yet there's this personal aspect to our tangle. And when we fully take that on board, we get to really start to roll up our sleeves and get to work on disentangling our own personal tangle. And then, and then there's this collective part to it. A, a, an organization that has nailed this, an organization that is a, a great model for us, I, w I propose is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and all of the renditions of it. It's amazing. They get the personal and the universal. And this is, this is the strength of these 12-step programs. And then you, 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 you see it, you know, they take they take full responsibility for, for their own sobriety, and yet they lean in to their sponsor and they lean in to their group. And it's it's stunning. You meet people that um, have been clean for 30 years, 40 years, they're still going to meetings. They're still going to weekly meetings. And and uh this this is this is the Sangha. And this is what we can do. When we understand this tangle inside, this tangle outside, we, we get to we really dig down and get to work on our own tangle, 
and then and then we we realize like the enormity of the job and and we get to gather around us people like-minded that are doing the same work and we support one another this is the magic of what's happening in Seattle it's a, it's a model for all of us i have to say where i'm i'm really seeing a sangha growing and and it's one of the triple gems it 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 just as important and just as necessary as the buddha himself and the dhamma we need sangha and somehow the teachings have come to north america uh many of them f- through through lay practitioners and then th- there's been a model of these silent retreats and um yes a sangha forms but then this sangha disperses and actually the sangha doesn't really talk to one another we 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 need the group and uh this this understanding the the individual nature of our suffering and then the universality of our suffering is is a gateway to uh understanding the need of the group and um how helpful uh, how necessary we take refuge in buddha dhamma sangha so this this personal nature of the tongue uh, of the tangle uh that it that we each have our own conditioned based on our kama for sure manifestation of our en- entanglement with our existence with with life and uh, for my for myself uh a huge part of my tangle is um been uh really fully you know biting off chewing swallowing digesting a uh, a uh, story of shame and and shame is so difficult to work with uh the nature of shame you don't it, you it hides it's like a cockroach you know it it just sticks in a in a dark nasty damp corner and so when i started getting more and more honest and specific with my meditation teacher beth upton uh i had an interview with her which was a catalyst for me um uh taking taking some real growth steps on my own spiritual path and it's been so helpful and that's really the bulk of what i want to share to this morning when i got more and more honest with beth at one point in one interview she it's like she looked into me you know looked through me and she just said i ahimsa this story of worthlessness and this story of not belonging this came from the outside and, but then she said these words she goes but it's yours now and somehow something clicked a penny dropped and and i i i realized it, I, it was fully mine now I, there's no it, it's not really that important anymore how it got there i mean there's a piece to that but the point is it's mine now which this is very very significant um and i think especially significant in the culture that we're living in in north america that we realize that the buddha in his teachings is in giving us this very powerful invitation to take full 100% responsibility for our own tangle and then it's wonderful you're empowered you're not a victim you you get to get to work on your on your personal tangle it's a huge invitation take full responsibility it's actually a radical aspect to the buddha's teachings and uh you know we all have we all have this legacy of pain this legacy of burden we all, we all have it again it's you know different 
different degrees, definitely, and different different strands, different variations, definitely. Depends. Am I in a female body? Am I in a dark skinned body? Am I in a uh, able body or not able body? Am I in a body with chronic pain? You know, we all have a different legacy of pain, but it doesn't matter that much because the, when you take full responsibility, this whole lens of blame just just gets put down on the table. And, and it's not useful. And anyway, it's not accurate. This is the whole point, samsara. It's beginningless. There is no first abuser. There is no first perpetrator. I go back to my parents. Well, then you need to go back to their parents and then their parents. And this is the same for all of us, every single one of us. It's it's beginningless. And the, the Buddha says about the beginninglessness of it, that it's unknown and unknowable because it's really not where we need to be looking. We need to be looking at the direction the Buddha has given us for disentangling the tangle, which is pointing us to the exit door. It's pointing us to safety. It's pointing us to the way out. And, and this, this is important that we, we, we somehow get get bumped out, fully bumped out, fully bumped out of any victim track and get get onto the responsibility train, get off the blame tra- train and get onto the responsibility train because only then can you start moving towards the exit. You know, there's a simile that catches this so brilliantly where, uh, and, and this is samsara, this simile to me, and and our delusion and our ignorance and our ensnarement, ensnarement the simile uh, that many of us know where someone's walking barefoot and they step on a thorn and then they they devise a plan for putting leather over the entire earth this is trying this is where we look often and put energy often of trying to have Samsara not be samsara. And we can't, it's a it's a losing proposition. And the 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 eightfold noble path, the direction is we put leather on the bottom of our feet. This is this is us disentangling our own personal tangle. Uh, it's a it's a powerful invitation from the Buddha. And when we take it fully on board. So much of our unskillfulness begins to to drop away, and, and our and our thinking gets clearer, and 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 much more productive, much more useful, and and then we stop, you know, this deep, deep, deep yearning inside of each human being, wanting to get rescued. This, all of this behavior begins to untangle. And then, and then this behavior that we often engage in, where we're not holding others accountable, where we're we're trying to rescue others, this this unskillful be- behavior starts to fall away, and things just get much more clear. And then even you be you you grow your capacity to be with your own suffering, and then that in turn grows your capacity to be with the suffering of others, and actually do something that's helpful, which is help them see their own responsibility. You know, Beth Upton, in a group interview not long ago, this this topic of responsibility and accountability came up. And uh, she gave a great simile, you know, she said, it's like someone comes in, and this is talking about our own individual tangle. Someone comes in and trashes your kitchen. It isn't so relevant who did it. The issue is your kitchen's trashed. This is this is the issue. And the invitation is to get to work cleaning up the kitchen. And this is this is the invitation that the Buddha gives us and gives us such clear instructions for for how to do that work, sila, samadhi, panya. 
<clears throat> that being said, you know, when you do get to work on your on your own knot, your own comic knot, your own tangle, I'm talking about, you know, digging down and getting to like early wounds that have, have then shaped this contorted personality with all of our unskilled strategies that that grows out of this. Uh, you know, when we, it, it can become very useful to to start to to disentangle this tangle, uh, looking through like how did it get there? Looking through the responsibility lens, not the blame lens. Very very useful. And for for myself, and 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 uh, for me, like making quite a deep shift in my in my practice and in in my engagement with my own suffering, taking much more responsibility for it. I have come, I think, more intimately, become more intimate, more familiar with my own my own female body conditioning and and the 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 how that's compounded my own tendencies towards towards shame and 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 worthlessness and but the 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 truth is that even this male female binary is is also needs to just completely unravel and and be disentangled from you know eventually and you see this you see this in advanced practitioners i've had the privilege of seeing that when you're around someone like Bhikkhu Bodhi or Venerable Analio, you see this very androgynous, very androgynous human being that has uh, the full range, full sc scale of, of human qualities uh, available and, and, and developed. Same with, with female practitioners. It, uh, Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo comes to mind. Uh, very powerful women. So, we live in a culture where certain aspects of the, of the human expression, the human characteristics get labeled as, as, you know, having sort of a masculinity to them and then certain qualities with a, a femininity towards them, you know, qualities like confidence and can do ness and know-how and strength. You know, the, we tend to think of these as, as masculine and then, Qualities like nurturing and caregiving and and serving and empathy and get get thought of as feminine and and the truth is that that we're yeah the truth is spoken by Bhikkhuni Soma when she's having an encounter with with Mara this is also from the connected discourses in the first book uh, I think it, I think chapter five it's it's all, all these accounts of the bhikkhunis, but bhikkhuni Soma says Mara is trying to taunt her and, and you know, lay on, uh, hook her with her own female conditioning, kind of like, and it's got this worthless component to it. How could you in a woman's body with your two-fingered wisdom, you know? This is, this is a, a females can run up against this a, lo a lot. And I know I have. Um, but Bakuni Soma answers Mara. She just says, uh, what does womanhood matter at all when when the mind is concentrated well and when knowledge flows on steadily as as the mind uh, sees correctly into Dhamma? And, and she goes on, she says, uh, one to whom it occurs, I am a woman, or I am a man, or I am anything at all, is fit for Mara to address. And then it's great, you know, these, these, <laughs> these amazing bhikkhunis, Mara has his shoulders, you know, sag, and he slumps away. You know, because he's he's gotten nowhere trying to hook her because she's completely disentangled the tangle.
And uh, invariably, we are going to run up against our conditioning. You know, and, and with our, in our culture, I'm just going to talk about this one, one area, our, our gender. But this, this is true in, in each area of life. Uh, and the only reason to look at the conditioning is to take responsibility for the way that it's impacted you individually and then start to disentangle it. It's not through the lens of blame. It's not as a victim. It's as an empowered person that is cultivating, developing the mind on the on the path to completely disentangling and, and freedom and liberation. But because we've we've done this, this binary thing, and, and, and you just start looking around at the world. I mean, so many, so many issues come from this binary, 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 you know. And we're experiencing this so much in politics around the world now, this polarization, this binary. Whereas it's so fascinating, you know, looking at the Buddha's teachings, this this uh, not Western, not not from Plato and Aristotle, but from from Indian culture, where it's not binary. It's either it is or it isn't, or it it both is and isn't, or it neither is or isn't. A very different framework and very useful for us to fully take on board. But uh, so I'll just do a tiny bit about about gender because it it's what's really alive for me at at this time. Uh, because certain things are viewed as uh, masculine, certain qualities are viewed as feminine, then if you're in a masculine body, the the some of the aspects of uh, the human experience that are are viewed as feminine are are not very welcome and they're not well received. And this this happens sadly for for people born male, this happens instantly. Uh, the The most powerful research is from a psychologist at at Harvard, and his name's William Pollock. He's done a lot of research and he's written several books. And the first one goes back about 25 years. It's called Real Boys. And he's talking about the boy code. And he's he's talking, he, he his research, he's filmed endless hours of caregivers with infants, both male and female. And it's noticeable, it's striking. When a caregiver is with a male infant, there are certain emotions that come across that infant's face, like fear or sadness, and they are not mirrored back nearly to the extent that they're mirrored back with a caregiver interacting with a female infant. So it's it's from the get-go for, for men that they, they're getting a very strong message that certain emotions aren't okay. They're not welcome. They're not, they're not mirrored back. Fear, sadness, and, and, and with that, of course, you know, weakness, vulnerability, unsureness, which is why we have this, the confidence is, uh, uh, there's pressure for, for men to, to know, pressure. And, it, and it, it's deep. And yet, you start the spiritual path. You have to completely step into the unknown. Yeah. And for, for females, you know, same thing. There are certain emotions that aren't welcome. They're, and, they're, and, and so what does a female do when they have these emotions? Well, they invariably, you know, do something that, that entangles them. And some of the emotions that aren't... Uh, welcome in the culture or uh, uh, probably the big one for women is anger and yet we all have this kilesa and then for for myself i can speak um 
I, I have this double whammy of working with anger because I, I haven't actually been honest about the anger that's there. And I haven't uh, had uh, much experience sitting with that emotion and, and learning how to be skillful with it. Uh, you know, for, for women, I'll just do one quick example. And it comes from a person who was born male and transitioned to female. And their name is, their name now it was Paul, and now their name's Paula, Paula Stone Williams. And they're a very successful business person and transitioned late in life in their 50s. And they, they, they have a memoir, it's called as a woman, what I've learned about power, sex, and the patriarchy since transitioning. And in it, they describe being uh, being in a business meeting at, at, before they transitioned as a man and expressing anger and it being fully received. And in fact, you know, in some ways, adding some clout to to their to their rant to their to their to their argument to to their stance and uh being seen as uh, you know uh passion and strength and they said uh fast forward and they've transitioned they're in a female body they would do the same thing in a business meeting and it, completely not received and immediately the issue becomes that they're the crazy lady and there's all this emotionality and what they have to say is, is, is it isn't it isn't even taken into account it's just it's just the anger becomes this uh elephant in the room so i just offer that as as very small examples uh and so because for me, as I've started to get really like feel 100% responsible for this tangle that I have, uh, I've, I've definitely been rubbing up against uh, unfamiliar places and, and, and seeing the way that my particular conditioning has, my response to it has been very much to... Um, contort and and get squished and 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 the, and the shame piece was keeping me like just totally entangled uh but there's the invitation from the buddha to disentangle completely a tangle inside dukkha dukkata sankara dukkata vipari nama dukkata a tangle outside, same. This generation is entangled in a tangle. I ask you, O Gotama, who can disentangle this tangle? And the Buddha has an answer. And it's the Eightfold Noble Path, developing sila, samadhi, which leads to panya. And the invitation is there for each and every one of us, that we can, doesn't matter how big how tight that knot is it's our job to roll up our sleeves and start to to peel away the layers peel away the conditioning and disentangle our own tangle so i i offer those thoughts this morning and 